wonderful time. One of the things that they talked about one night was practicing peacemaking. And, and, get, and I probably need help from those who went. Um, we had one speaker in particular that went through a lot of turmoil in high school, didn't he? Because he was a little different. And the theme for that night was bullying or anti-bullying, right? And it said sometimes it starts with just a couple of words which escalates into something more physical violence or something like that. It's amazing what words can do. Words can heal. Words can hurt. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, which is wrong. That's the underlying basis of, of violence in our communities. We remember what happened on Sunday with a Sikh community. And I never even knew what a Sikh was until Sunday. And then there's all kinds of information about them. They, they are uh, peacemaking, they have community, they have a strong sense of loyalty, they have all these different things that I look at and I say, yeah, that's, I can relate to that. That's all part of what my faith is all about too. They're not that different than I am. And as a Christian, I've got Jesus Christ as that symbol, that, that person that God come down for us to give us that intimate relationship with God the Father. God make, Jesus makes God Father to us, an intimate relationship with us. And Jesus in his life and his death showed us the way of peace, showed us the way of reconciliation. Unfortunately, I was brought up in a, in a time where you fight fire with fire, basically. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Turn the other cheek was something those people in church said didn't mean anything. It was just a nice saying. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth was what was really happening. And so I came up believing that in my life, war was inevitable. It was necessary. It's something that we, we need to do, first and foremost, before anything else. Jesus shows us another way of, of reconciliation, of, of, of offering yourself not as a, as a victim, but as a, a peaceful person who, who wants to seek a different way to make things happen, to make things right. You all remember Popeye, this cartoon Popeye? I see all the older adults going, yeah, the younger kids going, have no clue who that is. Popeye and Bluto, of course. Bluto takes olive oil. Ah, oh, oh. Popeye, Popeye, save me. And Popeye comes and he gets, Bluto's huge. And Popeye just a skinny little around with a pipe, you know, and a corn cob pipe. And Bluto just knocks him into the ground. And he's beating up on olive oil. And pretty soon Popeye is, is almost down. And then his can of spinach pops out, right? Yeah. And he, he eats it through his pipe. I, I never tried that. He eats it through his pipe. And he gets, and you see him, and he gets, he stands up, he gets big forearms, he gets huge. And then he just takes Bluto and just turns him around and, Beats them up and takes olive oil and they go happily on their merry way. You know, and then, and then the next time it's the same thing over and over and over again. Nothing really gets resolved. It's the same old Pluto does this, Popeye does that, and they go on continuing on and on and on. An endless circle have it. Uh, what would happen if Popeye and Pluto were to sit down and talk about their differences? Or what would it happen if they actually talked about what was going on? Maybe something would be resolved so you wouldn't have the same cycle of you know, this and then that, and what would the difference be? How would that be different? We had 16 million deaths around that in, in World War II, and that's everybody worldwide. World, in World War I, excuse me, World War II was, was a higher number, 60 million or something like that. And then these other wars that come along, Korea, Vietnam, Desert Storm, Desert Shield, all these things have contributed you know, I didn't realize Vietnam started in 1955, and we had got involved in the 60s at some point. But they were, they were killing their own before we even got involved. And it's amazing what, what those kinds of numbers will mass to. And it's just, you know, 58,000 in Vietnam, U.S. alone, and that's just an, out, an outrage. And I, and I, and I, I heard from NP, on NPR that last night, at Miller Park, they had a, a, 
a preview of the movie for the honor flight. I think it was a sold out house. You couldn't get tickets anyway. It was a sold out place. So last night they showed the movie about these, these vets from World War II who served, who spoke maybe for the first time of their uh, time in World War II, what it was like. And it's very emotional. Very emotional for everybody involved, for the people that were there, the families, those things that they sacrificed. You think, why can't we come to some kind of resolution where they wouldn't have to do that kind of a thing? Where are we as Christians that we, in other faiths, that we can't come together and talk? The one thing that, that happened with this, this massacre on Sunday was now that people know what a Sikh community is and what Sikhs believe. And, and they're not that different than we are. And we have thousands of people gathering at a memorial service of all faiths, of all ages, and in all cultures coming together to support each other and say, we're, we're all together in this. Whether you're black or white or Hispanic or gay or straight or, or whatever it is, we're all people. We're all that people that Jesus came to be the bread of life for. God loved this world. God wants to see something important, exciting happen with what's going on in the world with people. Never stops trying to, to goad us into doing the right thing to, to seek peace first. And if necessary, bring arms. I had a friend at the health club who just a month ago found out that I was a pastor. I've been there since 2005, and he finally found out I was a pastor. And oh, well, here we go, you know. <laughs> yeah, I got something for you. You can use this in your sermon. They go, well, maybe not, but I'm not going to tell you that. But, you know, fold it and put it in my pocket. And he was saying yes, yesterday or, or Friday morning, he's, he grabbed me and said, I'm serious. You've got you to allow firearms in your church. He said, I'm serious now. And he, he was a Marine, you know, probably in Vietnam or one of those wars. And I understand where he's coming from. He wants to make sure that we're protected in here. He, he doesn't want to see this thing happen again. But I felt an anger well up in me, and I said, that's the last thing I'm going to allow in this church because that's not who we are. We're not going to have armed guards outside with automatic weapons searching everybody who comes into this place of welcome and peace and, and more. I certainly understand that people have a different way of coming around things. I'm just trying to wrap my head around this nonviolent resistance that Martin Luther King was so famous for and Gandhi was so famous for, and I don't know if I have the courage for it, but I'm trying to understand what it's all about. Because I'm big and strong and I can do things physically to defend my family, whatever means necessary. And then, unfortunately, I, I, I would probably go force first and, and talk later. But that's an initial reaction that I need to, to, to work on and, and to say, well, as a person of Christ, what do I do? What is my calling? What is my first response to be? And how can I make that a habit of my lifestyle? This whole thing brings up a confusion in my mind. It, it makes me search and fi figure out what is this peace and reconciliation Jesus was so adamant about to teach his disciples to show us in this, in this life. What, what is that that we're to do? It's a whole different way of thinking for a, a lot of us. But I think that's what Jesus is trying to push, trying to make available to us. Jesus said on the, on the Sermon on the Mount that, you know, the Beatitudes in Matthew 5 that Blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are the meek, blessed are the humble, blessed are the poor in spirit, and so on and so forth. The, the oppressed, the ones that are humble, the ones that are outsiders, those that are vulnerable. Give them a second look. It's important for us to see that. that sometimes we're part of that. At times we're not. But at least relate to it. Claim it is that's part of who we are. It's not us and them, it's us, neighbors. We're all neighbors in this. It's not a, a way of saying, those people out there in that country, those people out there, it's, the world is smaller now. We can get in contact with people in seconds and be on Skype and whatever else. The world is getting smaller and smaller. There's more ways of connecting than ever before. There's more ways of, of communicating, of understanding, of of all these kinds of things of building bridges than ever before. We have all this possible to us. 
It's a matter of us taking the step and going outside a little bit and, and seeking the ways of understanding our neighbor, understanding that the Sikh community are our neighbors. The people over in Afghanistan are our neighbors. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I come down to give my life so that you may have life and have it abundantly. It's a claim that he makes with his life. He's dead serious about this. For us, we don't understand it completely, but we know it's there. It's a mystery that we need to solve in our minds or just simply accept that God loves us in this way that Jesus was the final sacrifice so that we wouldn't have to do that anymore. The God in, of, of peace and mercy and, and justice of having everybody having enough. That is the God that Jesus has embodied and lived among us and walked in sandals and a robe. God is with us. Amen.